namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa So this afternoon I'll continue reading uh, the Ajahn Cha talk entitled In the Shape of a Circle, translated by Ajahn Jeff. However, I don't actually recall where I left off, so I'll just pick a spot and uh, we'll go from there. Stillness of mind, tranquility, comes from being far away from preoccupations. If you don't hear much of anything, the mind settles down and is, and is still. To get this kind of stillness, you have to go off into seclusion, to a place that's quiet and still. If you can get away from your preoccupations, not seeing this, not knowing about that, the mind can settle down. But that's like a disease, a disease like cancer. There's a swelling, but it doesn't yet hurt. It's not yet tormenting us, it doesn't yet hurt. So we seem to be well, as if there were no defilements in the mind. That's, a, that's what the mind is like at times like that. As long as you stay there, it's quiet. But when it comes out to look at sights and hear sounds, then that's the end of it. It's not at its ease anymore. How can you keep on staying alone like that so as, to, so as not to see sights, hear sounds, smell aromas, taste flavors, or touch tactile sensations. Where can you go? There's no place in the world like that at all. The Buddha wanted us to see sights, hear sounds, smell aromas, taste flavors, or touch tactile sensations, hot, cold, hard, soft. He wanted us to be acquainted with everything. He didn't want us to just run away and to, he didn't want us to run away and hide. He wanted us to look and, when we've looked, to understand. Oh, that's the way things are. He told us to give rise to discernment. How do we give rise to discernment? The Buddha said that it's not hard, if we keep at it. When distractions arise, oh, it's not for sure, it's inconstant. When the mind is still, don't say, oh, it's really nice and still. That too isn't for sure. If you don't believe me, give it a try. Suppose that you like a certain kind of food and you say, boy, do I really like this food. Try eating it every day. How many months could you keep it up? It won't be too long before you say, enough, I'm sick and tired of this. Understand? I'm really sick and tired of this. You're sick and tired of what you liked. We depend on change in order to live, so just acquaint yourself with the fact that it's all inconstant. Pleasure isn't for sure. Pain isn't for sure. Happiness isn't for sure. Stillness isn't for sure. Distraction isn't for sure. Whatever, it's, it all isn't for sure. Whatever arises, you should tell it, don't try to fool me. You're not for sure. That way, everything loses its value. If you can't think in that way, if you can think in that way, it's really good. The things you don't like are all not for sure. Everything that comes along isn't for sure. It's as if they were trying to sell you things, but everything has the same price. It's not for sure. Not for sure in any way at all. In other words, it's inconstant. It keeps moving back and forth. To put it simply, that's the Buddha. Inconstancy means that nothing's for sure. That's the truth. Why don't we see the truth? Because we haven't looked at it looked to see clearly. Whoever sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha. If you see the inconstancy of, every, of each and every thing, you give rise to Nibbida, disenchantment. That's all this is, no big deal. That's all this is, no big deal. The concentration in the mind is, no big deal. When you can do that, it's no longer hard to contemplate. Whatever the preoccupation, you can say in your mind, no big deal, and it stops right there. Everything becomes empty and in vain. Everything that's unsteady, inconstant, it moves around and changes. 
It's inconstant, stressful, and not self. It's not for sure. It's like a piece of iron that's been heated until it's red and glowing. Does it have any spot where it's cool? Try touching it. If you touch it on the top, it's hot. If you touch it underneath, it's hot. If you touch it on the sides, it's hot. Why is it hot? Because the whole thing is a piece of red-hot iron. Where could it have, where could it have a, co a cool spot? That's the way it is. When that's the way it is, we don't have to go touching it. We know it's hot. If you think that this is really good, or this is good, I really like it. Don't give it your seal of guarantee. It's a red-hot piece of iron. Wherever you touch it, whatever you hold on to it, it'll immediately burn you in every way. So keep on contemplating, whether you're standing or walking or whatever, even when you're on the toilet or on your arms round. When you eat, don't make it a big deal. When the food comes out the other end, don't make it a big deal. Whatever it is, it's inconstant. It's not for sure. It's not truthful in any way. It's like touching a red-hot piece of iron. You don't know where you can touch it because it's, all, it's hot all over. So you just stop touching it. This is inconstant. That's inconstant. Nothing at all is for sure. Even our thoughts are inconstant. Why are they inconstant? They're not self. They're not ours. They have to be the way they are. They're unstable and inconstant. Boil everything down to that. Whatever you like isn't for sure. No matter how much you like it, it isn't for sure. Whatever the preoccupation, no matter how much you like it, you have to tell yourself, this isn't for sure. This is unstable and inconstant. And keep on watching. Like this glass. It's really pretty. You want to put it away so that it doesn't break. But it's not for sure. One day you put it right next to yourself and then, when you reach for something, you hit it by mistake. It falls to the floor and breaks. It's not for sure. If it doesn't break today, it'll break tomorrow. If it doesn't break tomorrow, it'll break the next day, for it's breakable. We're taught not to place our trust in things like this, because they're inconstant. Things that are inconstant, the Buddha taught that they're the truth. Think about it. If you see that there's no truth to things, that's the truth. That's constant, for sure. When there's birth, there has to be aging, illness, and death. That's something constant and for sure. What's constant comes from things that aren't constant. We say that things are inconstant and not for sure, and that turns everything around. That's what's constant and for sure. It doesn't change. How is it constant? It's constant in that, in that that's the way things keep on being. Even if you try to get in the way, you don't have an effect. Things just keep on being that way. They arise and then they disband, disband and then arise. That's the way it is with inconstancy. That's how it becomes the truth. The Buddha and his noble disciples awaken because of inconstant things. When you see inconstancy, the result is nibbida, disenchantment. Disenchantment isn't disgust, you know. If you feel disgust, that's wrong, the wrong kind of disenchantment. Disenchantment isn't like our normal disgust. For example, if you live with your wife and children to the point where you get sick and tired of them, that's not disenchantment. It's actually a big defilement. It squeezes your heart. If you run away from things like that, it's being sick and tired because of defilement. That's not nibbida. It's actually a heavy defilement, but we think it's disenchantment. Mm -hmm. Suppose that you're kind to people. Whatever you have, you want to give them. You sympathize with them. You see that they're pretty and lovely and good to you. Your defilements are now coming around from the other side. Watch out. That's not kindness through the Dhamma. It's selfish kindness. You want something out of them, which is why you're kind to them. It's the same with disenchantment. I'm sick and tired of this. I'm not going to stay any longer. I'm fed up. That's not right at all. It's a big defilement. It's disenchantment only in name. The Buddha's disenchantment is something else. Leaving things alone, putting them down. You don't kill them. You don't beat them. You don't punish them. You're not nice to them. 
you just put them down. Everything. The same with everything. That's how it has to be. Only then can you say that your mind has let go, that it's empty, empty of clinging, empty of enchantment, empty of attachment. Emptiness doesn't mean nobody exists, or like this glass. It's not the case that it has to not exist for us to say that it's empty. This thermos exists, people exist, everything exists, but those who feel in their hearts that these things are truths, they're not for sure. They simply follow their conditions. There are dhammas that arise and disband, that's all. Take this thermos. If we like it, it doesn't react or say anything. The liking is all on our side. Even if we hate it and throw it into the woods, it still doesn't react. It doesn't respond to us. Why? Because it's just the way it is. We like it or dislike it because of our own attachment. We see that it's good or no good. The view that it's good squeezes our heart. The view that it's no good squeezes our heart. Both are defilements. So you don't have to run away from things like this. Just understand this principle and keep contemplating. That's all there is to it. The mind will see that these things are no big deal. They're just the way they are. If we hate them, they don't respond. If we like them, they don't respond. We're simply crazy of our own accord. Nothing disturbs us, but we get all worked up. Try to see everything in this way. It's the same with the body. It's the same with the mind. It's the same with the moods and preoccupations that make contact. See them as inconstant, stressful, and not self. They're just the way they are. We suffer because we don't want them to be this way. We want to get things that we simply can't get. Is there something you want? And this is a question. I guess it's like when I want concentration. I want the mind to be quiet. This is the reply. Okay, it's true that you want that. But what's the cause that keeps your mind from being quiet? The Buddha says that all things arise from causes, but we just want the results. We eat watermelons, but we've never planted any watermelons. We don't know where they come from. We see when they're sliced open and they're nice and red. Mmm, looks sweet. We try to eat, we try eating them, and they taste good and sweet. But that's all we know. Why watermelons are the way they are, we have no idea. That's because we aren't all around. All around in what way? It's like watering vegetables. Wherever we forget to water, whatever, wherever we forget to water doesn't grow. Wherever we forget to give fertilizer doesn't grow. Contemplate this principle and you'll give rise to discernment. When you've finished with things outside, you look at your own mind. Look at the affairs of your body and mind. Now that we're born, why do we suffer? We suffer from the same old things, but we haven't thought them through. We don't know them thoroughly. We suffer, but we don't really see suffering. When we live at home, we suffer from our wife and our children, but no matter how, how much we suffer, we don't really see suffering, so we keep on suffering. It's the same when the mind doesn't get concentrated. We don't know why it won't get concentrated. We don't really see what's actually arising. The Buddha told us to look for the causes of what's arising. All things arise from causes. It's like putting water in a bottle and giving it to someone to drink. Once he's finished drinking it, he'll have to come back and ask for more. For the water isn't water in a spring. It's water in a bottle. If you show the spring to the person and tell him to get water there, he can sit there and keep on drinking water and won't ask you for any more, for the water never runs out. It's the same when we see inconstancy, stress, and not self. It goes deep, for we really know. We know all the way in. Ordinarily, knowledge doesn't know all the way in. If we know all the way in, it never goes st grows stale. Whatever arises, it's already right. When it disbands, it's already right. As a result, it's right without stop. The view that says, that's the way it is. It's the right, the right way, is, it's the right way it is. That's when you've got it. That's when, you, that's when you're skilled and at ease. You don't have to suffer. 
the problems that we get involved with and cling to will gradually unravel. As the Buddha said, we simply we see simply that things arise and then disband, disband and then arise, arise and then disband. Keep watching this Dhamma constantly, doing it constantly, developing it constantly, cultivating it constantly, and you'll arrive at a sense of disenchantment. Disenchantment with what? Disenchanted with everything of every sort. The things that come by way of the ears, we already understand them. By way of the eyes, we already understand them. By way of the nose, we already understand them. By way of the tongue, we already understand them. The things that arise at the mind, we already understand them. They're all the same sort of thing, and all of them the same sort of thing. Eko dhammo, one dhamma. This dhamma is inconstant, stressful, and not self. You shouldn't cling to anything at all. That way, disenchantment will arise. When the eye sees a form, you already understand it. When the ear hears a sound, you already understand it. You understand all about it. These things will sometimes make us happy, sometimes sad, sometimes make us feel love, sometimes make us feel hatred. We already know all about these sorts of things. If we cling to them, they turn into issues. If we let them go, let forms go the way of forms, sounds the way of sounds. If we send them back and let them go their own way, when we can stay at this level, the Buddha said that we will see all about inconstancy. Whatever the preoccupations that arise, they're all simple, they're all empty and in vain. They're all deceptions. When we see through the things that used to deceive us, when we're intent on staying at ease, mindful, alert, and discerning, it's not that we see anything else. We simply see that all the preoccupations that arise are simply the way they are. Even if, while we're sitting perfectly still, the mind thinks about this or that, it doesn't matter. It's just an affair of thinking. <coughs> you don't have to believe what's, what it's thinking about. If the mind is peaceful and you feel, ah, it's nice and peaceful. The peace doesn't matter either. Peace is inconstant too. There's nothing but things that are inconstant. You can sit and watch the Dhamma right there. Discernment arises. What reason is there to suffer? We suffer over things that never amount to much. We want to get this. We want it to be like that. We want to be something. If you want to be an Arahant, you immediately suffer, right here and now. Arahants have stopped wanting to be like this or like that. But we want to get this and get that, to be this and be that, so we're sure to suffer. If you see that this spot is good or that spot is excellent, it all comes out of you. If you see yourself, that's the end of saying things like that. I'll give you a simple comparison. This food is good. This tray is worth this many hundreds. That tray, this many tens. They're all nothing but good things. When they're on plates, this is mine, this is yours. But when they've gone into the stomach and come out the other end, nobody argues over whose is whose, or who would you still, or who, or would you still want to argue? That's what it's like. When you're willing to admit the way things are, that's just what it's like. If we don't really understand, we argue over what's mine and what's yours. But when they all come together as the same sort of thing, nobody lays any claims. They're simply the condition they are. No matter how wonderful the food might be, when it comes out the other end, if you wanted to give it as a gift to your brothers and sisters, no one would want it. Or would you still want it? Nobody would fight over it at all. For this reason, if we gather things together as eko dhammo, one single dhamma, and see that their characteristics are all the same, it gives rise to disenchantment. This disenchantment isn't discussed. The mind simply loosens its grip. It's had enough. It's empty. It's sobered up. There's no love, no hatred, no fixating on anything. If you have things, okay. If you don't, it's still okay. You're at ease, at peace. 
Nibbanang Paramang Sukang, Nibbanang Paramang Sunyang. Nibbana is the ultimate happiness. Nibbana is the ultimate peace, emptiness. Listen carefully. Worldly happiness isn't the ultimate happiness. Worldly emptiness isn't the ultimate emptiness. The ultimate emptiness is empty of clinging. The ultimate happiness is peace. There's peace and then there's emptiness, the ultimate emptiness. At the moment, though, the mind is at peace, but it's not ultimate. It's happy, but it's not ultimate. This is why the Buddha described Nibbana as the ultimate emptiness, its happiness as the ultimate happiness. It changes the nature of happiness to be peace. It's happy, but not fixated on any object. Pains still exist, but you see the pains and pleasures that arise as equal to each other. They have the same price. The objects we like and don't like are equal to each other. But as for us right now, these things aren't equal. The objects we like are really pleasing. The objects we don't like, we want to smash. That means they're not equal. But their reality is that they're equal. So think in a way that makes them equal. They're not stable. They're not constant. Like the food I just mentioned now. This is good. That's wonderful. But when they're all brought together, they're equal. Nobody says, give me a little more, I didn't get enough. It's all been brought together to the way it is. If we don't drop the principles of inconstancy, stress, and not self, we're on the path. We see with every moment. We see the eye, we see the mind, we see the body. Like when you sit in meditation, after a moment the mind goes off in a flash, so you pull it back. No matter what you do, it won't stay. Try holding your breath. Will it go away then? Oof. It goes, but not far. It's not going to go now. It circles around right here, because your mind feels like it's about to die. The same with sounds. I once stuffed my ears with beeswax. Noises bothered me, so I stuffed my ears. Things were totally quiet, with just the sound from within my ears themselves. Why did I do it? I contemplated what I was doing. I didn't torment myself just out of stupidity. I thought about the matter. Oh, if people could become noble ones from not hearing anything, then every deaf person would be a noble one. Every blind person would be a noble one. They'd be all be our haunts. So I listened to my thoughts, and oh, discernment arose. Is there any use in stuffing your ears? In closing your eyes? It's self-torment. But I did learn from it. I learned and then stopped doing it. I stopped trying to close things off. Don't go wrestling and attacking. Don't go cutting down the trunks of trees that have already died. It gets you nowhere. You end up tired and standing there looking like a fool. They were such a waste, such a real waste, my early years as a meditator. When I think about them, I see that I was really deluded. The Buddha taught us to meditate to gain release from suffering, but I simply scooped up more suffering for myself. I couldn't sit in peace, couldn't lie down in peace. The reason we live in physical seclusion, kaya viveka, is to get the mind in mental seclusion, chitta viveka, from the objects that stir up its moods. These, are th these things are synonyms that follow one after the other. Upadi viveka refers to seclusion from our defilements. When we know what's what, we can pull out of them. We pull out of, we pull out from whatever the state the mind is in. This is the only purpose of physical seclusion. If you don't have any discernment, you can call it, create difficulties for yourself when you go off into physical seclusion. When you go live in the wilderness, don't get stuck on the wilderness. If you get stuck on the wilderness, you become a monkey. When you see the trees, you miss the trees. You start jumping around just like the monkey you were before. The Buddha never taught us to be like this or be that. Sorry, the Buddha never taught us to be this or be that. When you live in a peaceful place, the mind becomes peaceful. Hmm, peace at last. The mind is at peace. But when you leave the wilderness, is the mind at peace? Not anymore. So what do you do then? The Buddha didn't have a stay in the wilderness. 
He had us use the wilderness as a place to train. You go to the wilderness to find some peace so that your meditation will develop, so that you'll develop discernment. That's so that when you go into the city and deal with people, with sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile sensations, you'll have the strength, you'll have your strategies, you'll have your firm foundation for contemplating things, to see how they're not for sure. Going to the wilderness in this way is something that can really help give you strength. If you think that you can live anywhere, that you can live with lots of people, it's like a knife with a double-edged blade. You don't have inner, if you don't have inner strength, you can create difficulties for yourself. It's like the monks who study the Abhidhamma. They say that when you study the Abhidhamma, you don't have to cling to anything, don't have to fixate on anything. It's nice and easy. You don't have to observe the precepts. You just focus right on the mind. That's what, the monk, that's what monks who study the Abhidhamma say. As for women, what's the matter with getting near them? Women are just like our mothers. We ourselves were born right out of that spot. That's bragging too much. They ordained just yesterday, and yet they refuse to be careful around women. That's not the real Abhidhamma. That's not what the Abhidhamma says. But they say that the Abhidhamma is on, a, is on a level higher than the human level. When you're that high, it doesn't matter whether you're so, near someone or not. There's no near, no far. There's nothing to be afraid of. Women are people just like us. Just pretend that they're men. That way you can get near them, touch them, feel them. Just pretend that they're men. <laughs> but is that the sort of thing you can pretend? It's a double-edged blade. If we were talking genuine Abhidhamma, there wouldn't be a problem, but this Abhidhamma is fake. The Buddha taught us to live in the wilderness, the proper way. When a monk goes into the wilderness, is to stay in a quiet place, to wander in the quiet wilderness, not to be entangled with friends and companions and other sorts of things. That's the right way to do it. But most of us don't follow the right way. We live in a quiet place and get attached to the quiet. As soon as we see a form, it gives rise to defilement. In our ears, there's nothing but defilement. That's going too far. It lacks discernment. If you bring things together, they come together at the path, the right path, or right view. That's where things come together. If you have right view, you can live with a large group of people, and there's no problem. You can live with a small group of people, and there's no problem. You can live in the forest or in a cave, and there's no problem. But this is something you can't just attain without any effort. You have to get so that the mind, the way the, so that's the way the mind really is. Make the mind know the Dhamma. When it knows the Dhamma, make it see the Dhamma. Practice the Dhamma so that the mind is Dhamma. You don't want to be able to just speak about the Dhamma. It's something very different. The Buddha taught all the. Tr taught all the way to the truth, but we only go halfway in half measures. That's why progress is difficult. If we come to live in the wilderness, we get to train ourselves, like training ourselves to grow rice. Once we plant it, it grows gradually. If nothing eats it, it's okay. But what happens? As soon as the rice grains begin to appear, a baby water buffalo comes to eat them. We chase it away and look after the plant, but as soon as more grains appear, the baby water buffalo comes to eat them again, keeps on eating as soon as the grains begin to fall out. If that's the case, how are we to get any rice? The strategies you'll need will grow from within the mind. Whoever has discernment gains intuitive knowledge. Whoever has intuitive knowledge gains discernment. That's the way it is. Are intuitive knowledge and discernment different from each other? If you say they aren't, why are there two different words? One is called intuitive knowledge. One is called discernment. Can you have only intuitive knowledge? No. You need to have discernment, too. Can you have only discernment? No. You need to have intuitive knowledge, too. Whoever has discernment gains intuitive knowledge. Whoever has intuitive knowledge gains discernment. These things arise from your own experience. You can't go looking for them in this book or that. They arise in your own mind. Don't be timid. Maybe I'll stop there.
I appreciate how <clears throat> Anshan Shah continually, or much of the time, lumps himself in the majority of people who are making lots of mistakes. And this continually says, us, we. And you know, yeah, that one, one wonders if that's actually true. Talk, he actually translates Puru as the knower. So it, I don't know. Yeah, that was 